Thank you, Frank, for the kind words. All right. Thank you, Frank, for the invitation and for the kind words. And um, good morning to everyone over there at Ecuador. So um, I'm Timothy, and I'm very glad to be sharing some of my work with all of you. So today, um, I'm going to talk about um, a particular nanoparticles, and these are called upconversion nanoparticles. So I'm going to um, I talk about one phenomenon called the cross relaxation in these particles. And I want to show you how I use cross relaxation to engineer all these nanoparticles so that they can be useful. Um, so before I start, perhaps I'll give you guys a quick introduction of NTU. Um, Frank is familiar, but for some of my colleagues uh, over there who are not familiar with NTU, um, we have a huge campus in Singapore Standard, but Singapore is really small. Um, the land is very limited, but our campus is actually located here. It's at the western part of Singapore. So Singapore, um, if you look at it, is about um, 40 kilometers across, uh, east to west, and from north to south, maybe about 25 kilometers, so it's a really tiny country. Um, so for a tiny country to have a um, pretty huge campus is a luxury. So we are actually located at the western part of the country, and the eastern part is the airport, it's the gateway to Singapore and the world. So um, I would love to host you guys um, if there's ever an opportunity if you visit NTU. So these are some of the um, cool architecture that we have in, in, on campus. These are for um, the, the one that you see here, they look like bee, it, it look like a beehives. So that one is actually um, a tutorial room. Um, we call it the, the, the futuristic learning hub. So this is quite new. Um, it's finished construction in about 2015. And one um, fun fact, NTU is actually the first ever Youth Olympic Games Village. The first Youth Olympic Games is held in Singapore, and the Olympic Village is actually in NTU. So a bit more about the university. So NTU, um, Nanyang Technological University, so we are very focused on technology. So um, therefore, we have a very huge um, College of Engineering. I think the students um, and faculty from the College of Engineering is about 62 to about 65 percent of the whole university. Um, so this diagram doesn't mean that we are at the center of the university, it just means that um, we have a, a lot of faculty and students, 60 odd percent, and we collaborate closely with all other schools, like the medical school, oops, sorry, the medical school, um, we got school of College of Science, um, Nanyang Business School and so on and so forth. And the Teachers Training College, uh, National Institute of Education is actually in NTU. So a brief introduction about the university. Okay, so um, a little bit about my group. Um, so these are my group members um, and these are my collaborators. Um, so um, I, for me, I'm particularly interested in nanotechnology for health and medical applications. Um, you can call it nanomedicines or nanotheranostics. Prior to that, I'm doing nanotechnology in general. So I do uh, nanomaterials for um, fuel cells, uh, for catalytic conversion, but now I'm focusing a lot more on nanotech for health and medical application. And I have a particular strong interest in a translation aspect. So I'm working with a lot of doctors, uh, clinician researcher in the university, and also in the hospitals um, to do like clinical trials. So some of my work, I'm pushing for clinical trials and so on. So this work that I'm gonna talk about um, is mainly done by um, my ex-PhD student, uh, Mr. Yu, now he's Dr. Yu, now he's now my uh, postdoc. And Prof. Zhang Yen, um, she was my PhD student and she's now an associate professor in Wuhan, in fact, in China and some other, uh, this is also my ex-PhD student. Um, so this, this work is mostly done by them. And of course, I thank the, found, um, the funding sources from Ministry of Education, um, from uh, NTU and from ASTAR. Okay. So let me start with an introduction of um, upconversion nanoparticles. So what are upconversion nanoparticles? So basically, up-conversion nanoparticles, they are inorganic material. 
unlike um, the organic chelates or organic compounds, these are inorganic materials, so they have crystalline structure. And all these materials, um, they are actually belong to the lanthanide series, so they are lanthanide nanoparticles like gadolinium oxide or um, ethereum uh, oxide, and we dope it with the lanthanide materials. So one cool thing about the lanthanide materials is um, they have this 4F orbitals. It's like the D orbitals, which is protected. So the D orbitals like we know, um, it's give transition metal their unique properties like the colors and so on. But for lanthanides, they have this um, shielded 4F orbitals, okay? And this shielded 4F four, uh, orbitals give lanthanides unique property, especially in emission property, fluorescence property, and up conversion is one of them. The other unique property that comes from the 4F orbitals is the magnetic uh, properties like gadolinium, dysprosium, all this they have got very well-known magnetic properties. In fact, gadolinium chelates is one of the MRI contrast agent. So gadolinium is GD as shown in the periodic table. Okay, so this, um, so lanthanides has very unique um, 4F orbitals because of the unpaired electrons in them and that gives it very interesting energy transition. See, so you can see that the 4F orbitals, they are partially filled, okay? And another thing about them is they have very similar atomic radi radii when they're in um, the ionic form. So if you look at the um, um, lanthanide 3 plus, the cationic form of the lanthanides, most of them, they have very similar um, ionic radii, meaning that when you dope the nanoparticles with different materials, the crystal structure remains basically the same. Because if the cationic size is similar, then when you replace it with something similar, the crystal structure remains the same. So with, because of that, um, if the crystal structure doesn't change, it will give it consistent fluorescent and magnetic properties. So this is another um, uniqueness of lanthanide materials. Okay, moving on, I'm gonna introduce the idea of up conversion and down conversion. So typically what we have in terms of emission is down conversion, which means um, we actually, sorry, so we actually have uh, materials absorbing high energy wavelength like UV, A, B, and C, and it gives out lower energy wavelength such as um, visible light or infrared light. Okay, so this is down conversion. But nano, uh, lanthanide nanoparticles, they have this unique up conversion property, which means they absorb low energy wavelength. For example, near infrared light. Okay, sorry. So it's in. So they absorb, they absorb near infrared light, lower energy, and it gives out higher energy light, such as the visible light or even UV lights. So this is what we call up conversion. You up convert low energy to higher energy. So absorb infrared, it gives out visible light. So this is what we know as um, up conversion uh, emission. So how does this work? So uh, I've come up with um, energy transition diagram that highlights the up conversion mechan me mechanism. So for lanthanide up conversion mechanism, you have to look at two different groups of material. One is the sensitizers, that means they absorb light. So in this case, you, the purple one is the sensitizer, a neodymium and ytterbium. So neodymium can absorb 808 and YB3 plus ytterbium can absorb 980. And if you look at the blue one, we'll call the emitter or activator. So emitter is the one that give out light. So we need a sensitizer that will absorb the light at a specific, a specific wavelength, 808 or 980, and these are near infrared. And then it should transfer the energy so absorbing at 980, it transfers the energy to the emitter and promote the electrons up higher to a higher um, level. And upon successive transfer of energy, it can push the electron higher and higher. So when it reaches a certain level, it, when it relaxes, it will give out a certain wavelength of energy that is unique to that band. So for this one, from 4F9 slash 2 to 4I15 slash 2, it gives out a red light, okay, for ytterbium, for, for erbium, ER3 plus. 
So if it absorbs 980 and get an electron up to a higher level, then it can emit green light. Because green is of higher energy, so it relaxes from a higher level to a lower level. So this is the uh, mechanism of up conversion. So it absorbs this narrow energy from ethereum. You will see the is narrower, and then from it jumps to the emitter, and from there it gives out high energy wavelength. So this is up conversion, a bit different from the conventional down conversion. Okay, so this is a general comparison between down conversion and up conversion. So you can see down conversion, it absorbs higher wavelength and it goes jump higher, but when you relax, it gives out a narrower wavelength of light. But for up conversion, it takes in successive amount of lower energy wavelength. That's why you can see it jump up in a ladder-like structure. And when you relax, it gives out higher energy. Okay, so low energy to high energy. All right. Okay, so what's so unique about up conversion? So when we look at up conversion, we typically like to absorb the light at near infrared. So near infrared typically starts from 700 all the way to 3000 nanometers. So between 700 to 3000 nanometers, um, there are actually different regions. Near infrared 1, which is from 700 to 1000, near infrared 2, from 1000 to 1700, and then 1700 to 3000 is in near infrared 3. So we classify that into three different regions. But what we are, I'm trying to say here is um, when we absorb light at near infrared, you can see that it can penetrate deeper because the absorption by the tissue, like hemoglobin or melanin in the skin, um, is much less at the near infrared region especially at 800 um, and you can see there's another dip at 1064 okay you can see that the absorption there is very low so if you absorb near infrared very low at that region that means it can penetrate deeper so the motivation is the when we shine the near infrared light onto tissue it doesn't get absorbed so much then it can penetrate deeper and excite whatever um, nanomaterials there so that it can deliver the functions that we want. And when we excite it, the light come out is visible light. So we absorb near infrared light, and what we can see is actually high energy wavelength, such as visible light. And um, you can even engineer the material such that you absorb near infrared, but it come out UV light, okay? But that's uh, more difficult to get. Okay, so this is the motivation for up conversion nanoparticles for bio application. Okay, so this is what I mean. This is the near infrared one biological transparent window. Okay, so you can see that at that region, um, the absorption by the tissue and by hemoglobin, by melanin, and by water is really low. That's why it is more penetrative. Okay, so I put down here a, uh, a comparison between down conversion and up conversion. Say for down conversion, because we use high energy wavelengths such as UV light. So sometimes UV light, um, they attribute that to um, DNA damage and cell death. And when you use um, UV light or blue light, it gets absorbed into the tissue a lot. While if you compare to up conversion, you absorb at near infrared light. Um, there's minimal photo da damage, high tissue pen penetration, better signal to noise ratio, and no autofluorescence. So these are the motivation behind the study of using up conversion nanoparticles for bio application. Okay, but of course, nothing is perfect. Um, so up conversion nanoparticles has very poor quantum efficiency, which means you have to shine a lot of light inside to get it to give out light, okay? That makes sense because we are pumping in low energy photon and we are getting high energy photon now. So we need to pump in a lot of low energy photon to excite it up the ladder structure to get one emission. So in terms of that, up conversion nanoparticles, it suffers from very poor quantum efficiency. Okay. And another thing about up conversion nanoparticles is um, they have this phenomenon called the self-quenching phenomenon, okay? which means if you put 
a lot of, let's say TM3+, plus, these are the emitters they give out like traditionally. But if you put too much TM3+, plus, you dope too much of them in a nanoparticles, let's say if you have more than 1% of TM3+, plus as an emitter, they go through this process called self-quenching, and it's through what we call the cross-relaxation. Okay? So how it works is like, you can see that, okay, um, using the same uh, mechanism that we looked at earlier, so if we excite an electron up, okay, and when it cross-relax means that it will only promote electrons of the same energy gap through here. And when this relax, it gives us heat, okay? So cross-relaxation means when it promotes something of the same energy gap, which there's no useful emission. Okay, this happens when we have all the dopant material very close together. So high emitter or activator concentration. So this gives the simultaneous energy exchanges between the ground and excited states, and therefore ultimately no useful light is given out. So only heat is given out. And if you want um, up conversion fluorescence, up conversion emission, then it's not useful because you want light, you don't want heat. And already, um, up conversion nanoparticles is very low in terms of quantum efficiency. So if there's cross relaxation, it will be even lower. So these are the um, two key um, bottlenecks that um, a lot of researchers have been trying to overcome um, and try to enhance the quantum efficiency and reduce cross relaxation. Okay, so um, putting aside the shortcomings, um, there are also there have been a lot of opportunities for up conversion nanomaterials. Okay, like I say, they have high penetration depth. They are very stable because they are inorganic material. Um, they don't photo bleach. They don't. The color doesn't. The emission doesn't get disappear very quickly. Um, unlike the organic uh, counterparts, they have very weak autofluorescence and they have very unique luminescent and magnetic properties. So this shows that. Um, up conversion material can go deeper, penetrate deeper into the tissue, and we can actually customize the emission um, to give up different colors. A bit similar to quantum dots, but not exactly, because quantum dots, they are generally more toxic. But this one, they are actually not, not that toxic because gadolinium has been used as an MRI contrast agent. So these are the unique opportunities. And there's a lot of work that has published or shown that up-conversion nanoparticles can be used for imaging, can be used for phototherapy, can be used for gene therapy, optogenetics, and of course, it can be used to study genetic system, diagnosis, and so on and so forth. So there's a very strong push towards um, the study of uh, up-conversion nanoparticles for biomedical um, application. So that's the introduction. So now I'm gonna um, give you guys um, a general scope of what I'm gonna talk about um, for my talk today. So I'm gonna talk about how to turn the tide on up conversion cross relaxation. As I mentioned just now, cross relaxation itself is actually detrimental. If you want emission, if you want fluorescence from the nanoparticles. So cross relaxation is generally are regarded as bad. We don't want cross relaxation. We want to minimize cross relaxation, so we want to optimize up conversion emission. But sometimes we should look at it from a different angle. If we cannot avoid cross relaxation, then why not make use of cross relaxation for another application? So, this is what I'm trying to say. I want to turn the tide on up conversion cross relaxation. So, instead of blaming up conversion relaxation, I want to make this, turn this into good use. So this is the main um, theme of my, work, uh, of my talk today. Um, it's mostly, it's all on cross relaxation and how I investigate cross relaxation and how I turn the tide on using cross relaxation for certain useful application. Okay, so uh, my talk, after the introduction, I'm going to talk about three different areas, which I have published into three different papers. The first one is more on investigating or understanding 
um, up conversion cross relaxation. So understanding um, how cross relaxation can give us certain advantage. The second one is about overcoming cross relaxation. So the way I do it is I engineer the nanoparticles into different structure so that I overcome cross relaxation and enhance up conversion quantum efficiency. And I show that um, it could be useful for cancer phototherapy. And finally, I'm totally using cross relaxation full on. So I don't want any emission. I'm just gonna use cross relaxation itself and use it for simultaneous phototherapy and photoacoustic imaging. So my talk, if you look at it in an overall scheme, they'll be broken into three main topics, which is understanding, overcoming, and exploiting cross relaxation. So the first one, understanding up conversion cross relaxation. So this work has been done much earlier in 2014. Um, what we're trying to do is we try to see try to understand further the cross relaxation phenomenon in upconversion lanthanide nanoparticles. So as I say, if you increase the concentration of the dopant, so in this case, oops, so in this case, if we increase the concentration from, two, from one to five to 10, and for erbium, if we increase the concentration from one to 10, 25, 50, it should encourage cross relaxation. But what we see here is, from here, there is a lot of cross relaxation, no doubt. But we tune the color from purple to a bit of pinkish to red. From erbium, we tune the color from green to orange to a bit of darker orange and finally to red when we increase the concentration. And this is due to cross relaxation phenomenon. Okay, so what, how does that happen? So you can see here very obviously that if we increase the concentration, so the whole emission shift from here down, when it's 5%, you can see here, and then when it's 10% it's red. While for another emitter, it starts with green, mostly green. But when we increase the concentration, it should go from green to yellow to orange to mainly red. So there's um, tuning in color here. And what we can see here is there is a change in color due to cross relaxation phenomenon. So if we, started, if we study the energy structure here, if it's at low concentration, you can see that most of them, they will just jump higher and higher and give us like the blue color, the purple color, the red color and so on. But if we have a lot of them, high concentration, you can see here there's like two TM ions. So if there are a lot of them in close proximity, you can see that a lot of cross relaxation happens. So you can see CR1, CR2, and all of them will dominate at one level, and most of them will end up being red. So from here, low concentration, it goes to higher level, but if it's high concentration, all of them will go to this level. You can see the red one here, and it will all come down. And this is due to cross relaxation. You can see the arrows here that shows the cross relaxation. Same here. So if it's low concentration for erbium, most you can see different color here, green, red, okay? But if it's high concentration and it, that promotes cross relaxation, you can see that most of them will populate at the red level and end up having red emission, okay? So even though now we show that this is a shift from the top, let's say blue to red, here is green to red, but the quantum efficiency is actually lower because we are sacrificing high energy emission. These are high energy emission, all right? The blue, the purple, the green, and we all move to red, low energy emission. So even though we tune the color, we sacrifice the efficiency, okay? But we manage to push everything to the low, uh, low energy emission and pure rate emission. So this is what we discover. So high concentration doesn't mean that it's useless. Well, we realized that there's a new cross relaxation pathway that can give us um, pure emission in red. So we understand cross relaxation better in this study. Now the second study, um, which we uh, published in 2018, is when we try to overcome cross relaxation. 
we try to make sure that cross relaxation is minimal so that we can get very bright emission. Okay. Um, and the way we do it here um, is through nanostructuring. That means we make core shell shell nanoparticles. But um, before I go into that, I will first introduce um, in this work, we try to use um, a different excitation source, which is 808. Now, 980 is the conventional excitation source for upconversion nanomaterials. Because when you shine in 980, you can see that when it transfers energy here, it gives the electron transition higher and higher. And this gap is similar to this gap and it's similar to this gap. That's why it can promote the jumping of the electrons. But 980 itself, um, there is a very strong disadvantage. 980 is strongly absorbed by water. And if it's absorbed by water, it will heat up the tissue. Okay. So we have this very strong heating up effect if we use 980. Then we try to change to another um, um, sensitizer, which is neodymium. So neodymium absorbs at 810, 808 or 810. And 808 is perfectly fine. It doesn't get absorbed by water. All right. So 810 has an advantage of reducing heating up effect for tissues. But the other thing with um, 810, if you look at neodymium, you notice that neodymium, it has got a lot of energy levels here. Okay. So a lot of energy levels, it will promote cross relaxation, like what I've shown you just now. Okay. So if we put neodymium directly together with the emitter, let's say if we don't have um, the terbium, if we get rid of YB, if we put ND3 plus and TM3 plus together, it will promote a lot of cross relaxation and ultimately get rid of the emission. So it's not good. So how do we overcome this? So we have to do a very precise engineering, okay, called nanostructuring. So we have to make sure that our nanomaterials are structured in a particular way. But when we structure nanomaterials, usually they become bigger and bigger, which is not good for bioapplication because it has been shown that for nanoparticles to be non-toxic or to have minimal toxicity, minimal toxicity means that they are easily um, excreted out of the body. Okay, so for them to have minimal toxicity, the nanoparticles have to be very small, less than 10 nanometers. And to do nanostructure material for nanoparticles below 10 nanometers is extremely difficult. So ultra-small nanoparticles are a good solution to avoid long-term toxicity. Okay, so we need to shrink down the particle size to avoid toxicity. But if we reduce the size of the nanoparticles, it's very hard to get good emission out from it. So we are faced with a lot of challenges here. We want to make small particles. We want to create a lot of structures within the nanoparticles, yet we want good emission out from it. So in this work, um, I will show that we have overcome all these challenges to get very good, we call it ultra small, super bright nanoparticles. So the way we do it, we make a core shell shell structure. So the core itself is maybe um, about four nanometers. Then we put an in intermediate shell, which is about 1.45 nanometers, and ultimately the outer shell, and this is about three nanometers. The whole thing is less than 10 nanometers. Okay. The reason we put this is because we want to avoid the red dot neodymium to be in direct contact with um, thulium, terbium, sorry. So we want to avoid cross relaxation and give it a strong emission. So we have to very precisely make these nanoparticles to have this core shell shell structure and everything has to be below 10 nanometers. Okay, so to um, have to make it less in terms of uh, toxicity for um, bio application. Okay, so the precise tuning of this nanostructure is actually very challenging, but we have to do it so that we can give it a favorable energy transition pathway. So we want the neodymium to transfer energy to ytterbium, from ytterbium transfer to um, thulium, um, terbium, instead of a direct trans transition. Okay, so 
our strategy to get a core shell shell nanostructure, and of course, uh, we made it. So within the core is actually um, the emitter TM. Then the intermediate shell is our ytterbium, and the outer shell is the uh, neodymium. Okay, and all this is below 10 nanometers. All right, and if you can see our TM, um, I would say they are quite uniform. Most of them, you can see that this is the core. When we put a second shell, most of them are the same size. When we put a third shell, most of them are the same size. So these are the size distribution. And um, uh, it's quite challenging to precisely tailor all these sizes so that they are uniform in sizes. And the shell is actually quite thin, one nanometers. So we made it. And you can see the significant improvement in terms of the emission. So for this case, we shine 808 light. So this is the one, the first one is the one with the core shell shell structure that I show you with um, emitter in the center, neodymium at the outer shell, the center shell is YB, okay? And see this one give very bright because of the nanostructuring. While the second one, we don't have that nanostructuring, it's all different configuration. So this one is only a core and a shell, okay? And therefore, you can see that they all are, have very weak up conversion. While this one, when we shine 808 on it, you can see that it is very bright. So there's core, shell, shell. So at is in a way like another shell, another shell. So this only core, shell, core, shell, and core, shell. Okay. So the core, shell, shell structure gave us a very bright um, up conversion emission. In fact, what we found is an um, increase in 48 times of up conversion uh, emission compared to the lowest one. Okay. So this is some of the example. And later, after we make this material, we want to demonstrate that um, it is good um, in terms of some therapy. So the way we do it is we try to do it to demonstrate cancer therapy by loading doxorubicin, a very common drug used to treat cancer, into a silica shell that we built around the nanoparticles. So if you can see, Oops. So there's a, the blue layer is a silica shell with pores and the tiny, tiny red dots are the doxorubicin. So what happened is that we put a molecular valve, the orange one, on the pores. So when 808 light shine on it, it gives out blue light. The blue light will open the valves and release the doxorubicin. Okay, so this is how we want to show that when we shine 808 light, it releases doxorubicin and it can be useful for treating um, tumor. So this is um, a cellular study, so we do it on cells. And if you just look at um, the pink bar, okay, oops. If you look at the pink bar, um, with increased irradiation time, uh, more cells uh, died, okay? So um, we look at the cell viability here. And then we move on to look at um, animal studies. So we implant a tumor um, subcutaneously in, uh, below, or below the skin of the, of, of the mice. And again, the pink graph show that the tumor size increased the slowest compared to others with our nanoparticles. The one loaded with Dr. Rubinson and um, shine by 808 light. Okay, and we can see that, like, you know, a lot of cancer cells died in this diagram here um, when we use our nanoparticles together with the um, 808 laser. So, proof of concept wise, um, it demonstrates um, potential application for this kind of therapy, photo triggered therapy. And it is successful because we have managed to make the particles really small. While it's being small, it's still very bright. So this is the second work that I would like to share with you and how we overcome cross relaxation. So the last part is on biodistribution study to show that it's not toxic. Now, um, the third work that I want to share with um, the audience is about how we totally embrace cross relaxation. So the first work we study cross relaxation the second one, we try to avoid cross-relaxation by minimizing cross 
cost relaxation and optimizing emission. But for this third world, we totally, we do not want emission. We don't want fluorescence. We don't want up conversion fluorescence, but we want up conversion cross relaxation so that we can get maximum heat out from it. So what's the motivation behind getting a lot of heat out from it? So let me talk about um, light induced heating. So heat therapy is very common in clinical setting. And um, a lot of doctors, they like to use heat because heat in a way um, is, in terms of managing patient expectation is easier. And the equipment is cheap, okay? And you don't need to use a lot of drugs. Okay, and um, the, the heat that is given out by um, materials, we can use it in terms for photothermal therapy. We use heat to kill cancer cells, for example, or the heat generated can be used for photoacoustic imaging. Okay, so what is photoacoustic imaging? Basically, photoacoustic imaging is ultrasound. So if you look at um, how ultrasound is actually generated, we use, say, for a laser. We shine on the tissue, the tissue absorb the laser, and there is a wave-like thermal expansion that give out acoustic wave. This acoustic wave will give out the ultrasound detector and it give you an image. So for the acoustic imaging is actually, we use heat to create acoustic wave, and therefore, um, from there we can get images. Just like uh, when uh, pregnant women do ultrasound to look at um, the, the fetus inside. Um, the, 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 the womb. So in this study, we want to optimize heating via optimizing cross relaxation. So we embrace cross relaxation so that we can get a lot of heat from there. And through the heat generator, we want to show that the heat can be used for photoacoustic imaging and the heat can be used for uh, photothermal therapy. Okay. So how, to, how do we optimize the heating? So for this case, we only use neodymium. Like just now you have seen, neodymium has a lot of energy structure. So if we use 100% neodymium, everything will cross relax. Everything will cross relax, okay, hopefully, and give out a lot of heat. So this is our idea. So there's no emitter in this case. It's purely neodymium. But we also include a tiny layer of Persian blue. PB, okay, so we put Persian blue. And we realized that when we put a tiny layer of Persian blue, which is an inorganic dye, um, it actually increases the thermal efficiency a lot. And the reason is because there is a new cross relaxation pathway as depicted here. See, without Persian blue, you can see that this is a cross relaxation. And then the heat given out is of this energy gap. CR1, okay. But if we have Persian blue, you can see that there is, there is another new cross relaxation pathway here that encourage cross relaxation here, but it give out much more heat due to the energy structure here. So no Persian blue, only this amount of heat. But with Persian blue, we have a lot of heat due to a new cross relaxation pathway here. So this is a new cross relaxation pathway that we discover and we propose um, in this paper, which was published last year. So these are the nanoparticles. So we, before we coat Persian blue, it's quite nice. After we coat the Persian blue, you can see that there's like an amorphous structure around it, okay? And this is after coating Persian blue. So the more interesting part is um, the photothermal effect. So if you look at a figure A here, um, the red one and the blue one down here, these are either pure Persian blue or pure neodymium nanoparticles. So when we shine 808 light, 808 laser, with time, you can see that they heat up, no doubt. But the heating is not a lot. When we stop here, the heating will disappear. But when we combine the two, you can see that the heating increased tremendously. In fact, um, this is one of the highest uh, reported photothermal efficiency at about 62%. So this heating efficiency is very high, and when we stop, it decrease. And the significant increase in photothermal efficiency is due to the new cross relaxation pathway, which I mentioned here. 
uh, which no one has reported. We are the first to report. And if you look at the photo thermal images, you can see that like with prolonged irradiation of the 808, you can see that it gets warmer and warmer. All right. And then if you look at figure E here, this is the photo acoustic images. So with our nanoparticles coated with Persian blue, it can generate heat. With this heat, we can get photoacoustic imaging and we can use the heat for therapeutic purposes. And in this case, um, we are just gonna use the heat to kill off cancer cells, just using heat directly, okay? So there's no chemicals, um, there's no um, chemotherapy drugs, so on and so forth. There's no oxygen, uh, a reactive oxygen species, just the heat itself. So again, cellular studies similar. If we um, use our nanoparticles with light, the cells die very quickly, okay? The more interesting one will be the animal studies. So this work champions a simultaneous diagnostic and therapy, meaning we use the same nanoparticle and we want to see that when the nanoparticles accumulate the most in the tissue, which in this case you can see, so this is the uh, in vivo photoacoustic imaging of the tumor. So again, same thing, we implant a tumor subcutaneously onto a mouse, and you can see that after 20, after 30 minutes, there's a lot of nanoparticles accumulate here. So once it reaches 30 minutes, it will start to shine 808, and then it will start to heat up, and then it will kill the tumors. So you can see that um, 8, 30 minutes is the maximum accumulation of the nanoparticles in the tumor based on the photo uh, acoustic images. And after that, 40 minutes, one hour, one and a half hour, two, two hours, the nanoparticles start to get carried away from the tumor. So once we see that it's 30 minutes, then we start to continue the irradiation of light. And if you can see here that this is our nanoparticles, the one with our nanoparticles, the one with the, the pink one, the same nanoparticles with Persian blue plus the laser, the rest are controlled. You can see that the tissues, they are still quite big. While for, for us with our photo uh, thermotherapy, the tumor remains at a very small size. We use five different groups. That's why there are five samples here for us to look at for comparison. And again, this is uh, the staining to show that the tumors um, are, killed, are killed, um after 15 days. So, so with this um, material, um, I have shown that we can turn the tide and fully exploit cross relaxation so that we get maximum heat out of the nanoparticles in order to achieve real-time diagnosis and together we deliver optimal therapeutic efficiency for the tumor. So, yeah, so this is the summary of the talk. Um, for the first part, um, after the introduction, we study cross relaxation so that we can get a pure rate up conversion up from our nanoparticles. But with pure rate up conversion, because of cross relaxation, we uh, sacrifice or we compromise on the quantum efficiency. Now, the second study, um, we overcome the deleterious effect of cross-relaxation via um, core shell shell nanostructures structure strategy. So these core shell shell nanomaterials, um, together they are below 10 nanometers um, so that it is safe um, for, um, to, for minimal toxicity for bioapplication. Even though it is small, but it is very high in terms of upconversion efficiency and therefore we can see that it can deliver or um, demonstrated quite well for cancer phototherapy. Now for the third one, it's totally different. We exploit fully the high cross relaxation effect of sensitizer only neodymium so that we get maximum heat. And with this maximum heat, uh, we are able to achieve a simultaneous photoacoustic imaging and tumor photothermal ablation. So we show that the tumor size remains very small 
um, after the follow therapy. So, um, in terms of future work, um, uh, there are a few areas that is still very much not investigated. Um, these are the areas that have been touted to be the next promising uh, work for upconversion nanoparticles. So one of it is to um, explore the lanthanide-based nanoparticles for near-infrared too. So just now I talk about near-infrared one window, which is from about 700 to 1,000 nanometers. The next window is not so much investigated. And the next window has a uh, better advantage in terms of deeper tissue penetration. So near-infrared two window um, is an area that is heavily studied for lanthanides of conversion nanomaterial. Now, another advantage um, for up-conversion lanthanide nanoparticles is to investigate the fluorescence lifetime imaging. So fluorescence lifetime imaging is, is very, it has got a significant advantage over fluorescence imaging because fluorescence lifetime is independent of depth. So no matter how deep your nanoparticle is, um, if you do fluorescence lifetime, then you can still get the same signal. But if you do fluorescent imaging, the deeper the nanoparticles, the lesser light that you will get because it goes much deeper into the tissue. So fluorescent light lifetime imaging for near-infrared one or near-infrared two windows is an area that um, is also very um, new and is worth investigating. Now the, the final one, um, which is a continuation of um, the last part of the topic that I talked about, about cross relaxation. So for this part, um, we can get a lot of heat out from it. But we know that nanoparticles, they are not FDA approved yet for treatment. But we can turn the table around and say that now we can use this nanoparticle just to study the effect of, let's say, um, reprogramming tumor microenvironment because it has been shown that heat can actually loosen out the um, microenvironment around the tumor such that it allows more chemotherapeutic drugs to access to the tu tumor which is inside. So heat has been shown to be able to um, loosen out the fibrous structure around the tumor. So we can actually use our nanoparticles to study um, tumor and microenvironment instead of applying it for um, treatment. Okay, so this is another way we can um, propose for the use of upconversion nanoparticles for the study of a different new phenomenon. So um, with this, uh, I would like to end the presentation. Um, thank you for um, your patience and your time. I know it's very early in Ecuador. Um, so if there's any questions, um, I will be very happy to answer. Yeah, thank you, Tim. Thank you again for your great war, uh, talk. Um, you will see the uh, questions on the chat and there is a order, so it will be easier for you to answer in, in the order. Um, okay. Let me look at the stop share. Yeah. The chat. Oh yeah, I saw too. Okay. Um, the first one, um, the question is, what is the likelihood of producing photo bleaching on the sample. Um, if it's organic sensitizer, photo bleaching is very probable because usually the organic bonds, they are not so strong compared to inorganic material. For inorganic material, we know that it's all locked into a, a crystal structure. So um, the emitter is actually doped inside the crystal structure. So it's very um, stable. And compared to organic um, sensitizer, well, when electrons move around, it may, uh, it may eventually destroy the organic structure and therefore lead to photo bleaching. So for inorganic materials such as lanthanide nanoparticles or quantum dots, photo bleaching is actually very, very minimal. So uh, we don't usually see photo bleaching in inorganic um, nanoparticles. We really want to use it for imaging or for treatment. I hope I answered that question. Um, second part, do you predict a good future for nanoparticles? No. Um, for the time being, um, I don't think if you want to sell nanoparticles for treatment or for imaging, it's very hard um, because there's too many unknowns. Um, the research of 
nanoparticles for potential treatment and diagnosis in vivo um, seems to be very promising, but there's still a lot of uh, toxicity effect or pharmacology, ph pharmacokinetics that has not been done properly. And I don't think in the recent five to 10 years, um, nanoparticles would be used to be injected into human for imaging and for therapy. That's why I propose that uh, we can use this unique property of upconversion materials um, for studies in animals to look at tumor microenvironment. And who knows in the future, maybe FDA approve it or they come up with a better way to um, create photothermal effect in the tissue. Then at least we know what's happening in the tumor microenvironment and we can um, borrow what we have studied now for future application. But um, to answer directly, no. Um, good future in the next five years, not really. Okay, uh, I'm not optimistic. But for studies, for ex vivo diagnostic, um, those are okay, but not for in vivo injection application. I'm excited for the potential of the application. When are you able to do real-time monitoring? Okay, real-time monitoring uh, for therapy. Okay, this is done already in the animal. Okay, but not in human yet. Like you can see in, in the mouse, um, in the photothermal therapy just now. Okay, I'll share my screen again. So, um, so this is already real-time imaging, but only in animals. So this is real-time, okay? We didn't kill the animal. So we, um, after we inject, then 10 minutes, we look at it. Okay, still not very bright yet. 30 minutes, not very bright. 30 minutes, we know it's the brightest, or 30 to 40 minutes, okay? You can, you can argue about that. So this is real-time to show that there's the maximum amount of nanoparticles accumulated in the tumor. And therefore, at 30 minutes, we continue to shine so that we use the heat generated to reduce the tumor size like this. So again, we, have, we are already able to do real time, but on animals, okay? Because we inject the nanoparticles in animals. And I don't think we can do it on human yet, unfortunately. So this one, um, I've answered this one. Um, so, uh, the, the other question is, can you get up conversion for core shell combination of lanthanide and other growth elements? Yes, of course. Um, we can do core shell, shell, the third shell, it could be something else, okay? Some people do um, silica, like I, I demonstrated also. So if you put a silica on as a final shell, you can actually um, enhance the emission. That's what we call the surface passivation. I have also shown that by coating a Persian blue as the outer shell, which is of a different material, um, then you can actually enhance the cross relaxation effect. But the difference is if you put a different material, um, they may have different mismatch in terms of the crystal uh, lattice and it won't grow so well. But if they are all the similar quantum dots material like here, uh, you can see that they grow very beautifully. So these are very good for publication. But uh, let me see. So if you see this, yeah. So see, because these are all the same material, that's why they grow very uniformly. But if you put a shell, a final layer, which is a different material, so you may not grow such uniform material. So this is the only thing about um, a crystal mismatch of a different material. Okay. Um, let me look at the question again. Okay. Check. Is it, uh, have you looked at using X-ray source? Ah, okay. This is a good question. Uh, Frank asked whether I've used that X-ray source as energy for deeper penetration into, t yes. Um, in fact, there are some, clinicians in Singapore. They are from the oncology department in Singapore General Hospital because X-ray source is already available in the hospital and X-ray can already do imaging. So why not we use X-ray to excite? And this is one of the few that um, a lot of clinicians are asking. And it's not difficult to just 
design the nano materials to harness X-ray source, but with X-ray source, it will be down conversion. It won't be up conversion because X-ray is high energy. And then we pump in X-ray, we get maybe UV, we get blue, we get red. So it's a down conversion phenomenon. So it's not up conversion phenomenon. But this is an area which is also quite um, interested, especially by the clinician. Okay, and I think this is the final question. Is it the up conversion phenomena observed with only organic material? Um, no. Um, if I understand correctly, because I'm, I'm not very familiar with the organic aspect of up conversion material, but I've seen people publishing up conversion organic material. Well, this work, because they are particles, they are inorganic material. There are pros and cons for having uh, for having inorganic versus organic upconversion material, for example. Organic materials, usually they are small molecules, which for a lot of people is easy, easier to pass through uh, FDA or for clinical uh, studies. Nanoparticles itself, um, it won't even go to the stage of a clinical study at, at this point of time. But for organic upconversion material, because they are small molecules, and because they're organic material, they will be very prone to uh, photo bleaching. That means once you inject into the body, maybe after you shine the light for 10 minutes, then the emission will be very low. That's because it has photo bleach. Well, if you use inorganic material, like I say, because of the crystal structure of it, it protects the emitter, the lanthanide dopant inside. That's why for inorganic material, um, it would not be so easily photo bleached. But inorganic material, they are crystalline structure that in 10 nanometers compared to less than one nanometer if you use an organic molecule. So that's the main difference. Okay, uh, so I think this is the last question. If use X-ray, what's the best dose? Well, that I'm, I'm not sure, sorry, I cannot answer this because I have not done any work in X-ray. Um, but I can say in general that if we use X-ray, we don't need to use a very high dose because when we use X-ray, it's going to be a down conversion process. So we are going to take in high energy X-ray, then the energy that we get out is lower energy. So we don't need a lot of high energy to get a significant amount of lower energy. So for X-ray, the dose is just, I could imagine that the dose would not be high. And you can get the emission that we want because it's a down conversion process. Okay, but for up conversion, we need quite a high dose of near infrared light, for example, so that we can keep on pumping the photon so that the electrons can be excited like in a ladder, ladder like structure to get the uh, higher energy wavelength out. Great. Uh, well, I think it was the last question. Thank you so much again, team, uh, to join us this morning and, and night for you. I uh, hope we can- Thank you, everyone. Uh, and um, yeah, I hope uh, when everything gets solved, uh, one of these days you can uh, visit us in, in, in the chai. You'll be my pleasure. Thank you very much for your time. Take care. Thank you, everybody. Thank you, everybody, to join the Take care. Take care, everyone. Stay bye -bye. safe. Bye. Bye. Bye.